As you might have guessed by the title, this week we're going to talk about the condition of women in Japan and the country's shifting demographics, starting from the most recent controversy surrounding the nomination of the Bank of Japan's next governor. But first of all, as usual, a little disclaimer. For this video, I'm basing my reasoning on data from papers and newspaper articles, but most of those come from a male perspective. I'm going to address some critical points when they come up, but since I am not a Japanese woman, if you want to really understand how it feels, go listen to first-hand experience as well. Also, content warning, later I'll have to talk about sexual discrimination and harassment. Now, let's start our conversation from the news. This February, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will have to decide who is going to be the next governor of the Japan Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, in substitution of current governor Haruhiko Kuroda. As a matter of fact, the head of the BOJ changes every five years, and the right to vote for the governor is entirely of the current government, so the decision is ultimately political. That said, the list of names that is currently floating around appears to be void of any female candidate, which is pretty embarrassing for the world's third largest economy. Nonetheless, we could see a woman being chosen as one of the two deputy governors. In a Bloomberg survey, 23 out of 36 economists named former BOJ official and chair of the Japanese Research Institute Yuri Okina as a possible deputy nominee. Another one could be Tokiko Shimizu, BOJ executive director. But many see this as Japan doing the bare minimum when it comes to diversity. And most still think we'll see no female deputy anyway. The most direct reason for the absence of female governor candidates is that the BOJ has a tradition of alternating the post between former finance ministry and BOJ officials. But unfortunately, both institutions have a very low proportion of women in managerial positions. The finance ministry counts 34% of women with career track jobs and a dismal 2.6% at the top posts while the BOJ has only 22% of women in career jobs and one female director out of 15. Another direct reason, given that, as I said before, the nomination is entirely political, is Kishida's apparent lack of interest for gender equality or diversity. Aside from the criticism he drew on himself when in 2020 he showed a picture of his wife in an apron waiting for him at the dinner table, Kishida only nominated five women for ministers, out of a total of 40 positions over two cabinets, and no women at all in the latest lower house steering committee. But all these direct causes obviously have much deeper roots, so it's now time to talk about the condition of women in Japan. Not many of you might know that, as it goes for most human societies, in the early days of its existence, Japan started as a matriarchal society. I already talked about this briefly in my previous video about impurity, but in prehistoric times, Japan was mostly populated by nomadic tribes of hunter-gatherers. Given the capital importance of reproduction in such small and fragile human groups, women were the social center of the group, protected and therefore living longer than their male counterparts, thus way becoming the heads of the community and the safekeepers of inherited wisdom, one of the most powerful tools at the time. In short, I would say that women had most, if not all, the political power. But during the Yayoi period, between 300 BCE and 300 BC, a great migration of people from what are now China and the Korean Peninsula caused a shift in the structure of society, for two main reasons. The first is the introduction of rice cultivation, which transformed the communities from nomadic to sedentary, and therefore shifted the focus from reproduction to field labor situation in which having many male offsprings is an economical asset. And the second reason is that the immigrating populations introduced Confucianism to Japan, a system of thought originated in ancient China that puts a strong emphasis on patriarchal society and male authority. Given these premises, all the social and political changes that ensued in the following centuries crystallized the position of women as subjects of the male population, up until the end of World War II and the beginning of the female liberation. But how is the situation now? How are women treated in contemporary Japanese society? This, of course, is a huge question, and what I'll show you is just a partial view, both for reasons of time and because I don't know everything about it. But to get the pulse of the situation, let's have a look at another piece of news, the case of Rina Gonoi. Rina Gonoi is a 23-year-old former member of the Ground Self-Defense Force, the Japanese Army, who on Monday said she had sued five other soldiers for sexually harassing her and also the state for failing to prevent the abuses and not investigating her claims. 
According to Gonoi, she had been the object of daily abuses from fall 2020 to August 2021, with harassment and possibly criminal abuses that included groping, kissing, and daily sexual remarks. She then quit her job in June 2022 and posted online what happened under her real name, because after she reported all this to her unit commander, she saw him trivializing the matter up to the point where this man cited family reasons for her resignation despite being fully aware of the situation. Only three months later, in September, the Defense Ministry launched a special investigation across all members of the army to look into cases of sexual harassment, receiving 1,400 complaints in the span of two months. That same month, the ministry confirmed Gonoi's claims and apologized to her, because during the investigation, the five soldiers first denied all allegations, but specifically confessed their action under the pretext of quote-unquote regular camaraderie. Last December, the ministry dishonorably discharged all five soldiers, but only suspended the unit commander for six months. After this, her lawyer said all correspondence from the perpetrators stopped, reason for which she decided to sue. Now, Let's get a general perspective of the harassment situation, shall we? As Shigenori Matsui writes in his sexual harassment in Japan, the country didn't have the legal concept of sexual harassment until the 1980s. In 1997, the Diet amended the Equal Employment Opportunity Act to impose a moral obligation on employers to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace against women. And only in 2006, just 17 years ago, the law was further amended to make the moral obligation a legal one, and expanded the definition of sexual harassment to include men. In my previous video about the situation of Japanese journalism, I already talked about a bunch of cases where female reporters were sexually harassed and how their body and sexuality is used by their superiors as a way to obtain information from targets. But it's not just that field. According to a government report, in 2016, almost a third of all employed women was harassed in the workplace. At least, I would say, because these statistics always depend on the legal definition of harassment and on the fact that many victims do not report the events to authorities for a multitude of reasons. And of course, harassment doesn't stop once you look out of the workplace. There's also the well-known Chikang phenomenon, word that translates to molester and has come to indicate acts of sexual harassment and especially groping performed on packed subway trains or other crowded situations. The reasons for these behaviors are many and include regular victim blaming performed also by the authorities, but most of all, a very puritan and somewhat non-existent approach to sexual education and discovery. The latter is also a byproduct of the incredible social pressure put on young people in particular, which translate as well into the sky-high suicide rates and the hikikomori phenomenon. This lack of exploration of sexual themes ends up creating sexually repressed adults who don't have a healthy sexual life and know very little about consent. I didn't have time to explore this theme more, but if you're interested, there's a bunch of resources that you can use. To name one, the Japanese branch of the Me Too movement, called We Too Japan. All these things that I mentioned so far are related to how the social role of woman is perceived and intended in the Japanese society. I mentioned earlier that Confucianism was the main reason for the establishment of a patriarchal society and for women to be seen as subjects of males. So much so that there's a vast number of social situations from which they were barred. For instance, in the various forms of traditional Japanese theater, women roles were, and mostly still are, all interpreted by men. But as obvious as it sounds, these conditions are not eternal, and social changes can happen. But in Japan, usually it's the government that has to start these motions. And one thing on which it could act today is the family registry. The family registry, in Japanese koseki, is a collection of legal documents that works both as a census and birth, death, and marriage certificates. Technically, there's two registers, one that lists individuals and one that lists families. But what concerns us now is the family one. And given that it's a family registry, it legally records both partners under only one surname. This is because at some point in Japanese history, if I'm not mistaken during the Edo period, in the absence of a male heir, a family could opt for one of two practices. 
The most common was for a man of another household, usually a lower social status, to marry into his wife's family and adopt her surname. The other was for an heirless family to adopt an adult male from another household and give him their surname on the family registry. But the civil code law that states there has to be only one surname for both partners dates only to the Meiji era, and it's been 27 years since the Justice Ministry's Legislative Council recommended a revision. This is because nowadays 96% of married couples in Japan use the husband's name. And besides being a violation of a woman's right to have her own identity, being unable to keep their surname can lead to a series of psychological and legal problems, especially when it involves other countries' bureaucracies. As a closing note on the matter, I would like to talk about the correlation between gender inequality and the shifting demographics. While I was researching for this video, I came across an article from the whole editorial board of the Japan Times that talked about the aging population and its correlation to women employment and the gender pay gap. But I'm willing to bet that the people who worked on the article were for the vast majority men and Japanese. This is because even if at some point they briefly acknowledge other causes, they basically attribute the most responsibility for the declining birth rates to the fact that women don't earn enough. They wrote that Japanese women would be more willing to have children if they earned more and wouldn't feel forced to be mothers and caretakers. Which is exactly what this article is implying, though, that the bottom line and true nature of female life is to be mothers and caretakers. This is just my analysis, that's what I felt reading this article, but I'll leave it in the description so that you can get an idea for yourself. All this to say that ascribing the demographic shift only to the gender issue is an ideological pitfall, and most importantly, it could be exactly the opposite. By that, I mean that I think the shrinking workforce and therefore the shrinking economy aren't caused by women getting jobs and earning less than their male counterparts. But the fact that the economy is shrinking because of the shifting demographics is part of why women are getting jobs in greater numbers, and therefore why the gender inequality problems started to appear clear as crystal. It would require an entire other video to talk about the causes of Japan's aging population, but if you remember what I said in my last news analysis, most developed economies start having a declining population. This is usually because in a wealthy and healthy society, having children is not the most efficient way to accumulate wealth or the only way to have a decent retirement anymore. Widespread wealth has been associated with a decline in birth rates all across the world, from places where living conditions for women are way better to places where they're worse. Japan's demographic shift to a shrinking population dates back to the mid-70s, when the country was becoming severely richer than when it was left in ruins after the Second World War, and this trend got exacerbated in the mid-1980s. This is going to be nothing new for anyone who studied Japan even a little bit, but in the 80s, the country experienced one of its worst economic crises ever, known as the 80s bubble economy. The social ramifications of such a devastating market crisis were a lot, and one of them appears to be a severely lower birth rate. Of course, gender inequality has some connections with the declining birth rates. If a family struggles to make ends meet, they are less likely to have a child. A very interesting paper published on the International Journal of Social Science and Economic Research by Imai Moe, Takeshi Tario, and Tsubo Shusuke, which I will leave in the description, analyzes various aspects of female employment in recent years and all the connected economical factors. And the study interestingly points out that the percentage of women trying to balance marriage and work in Japan is increasing, mostly because their husbands have no prospect for salary increases, while the national burden rate, which is the ratio between the mandatory public burden, like taxes and social security, to the national income in 2021 was of 48% meaning that the real income of families is shrinking. Moreover, while educated people can obviously aim at better salaries, working women with high education that give birth are not likely at all to return to work. But if the same woman lives with her parents, she's 4.4 times more likely to do so. Another factor for the declining demographics is that Japan is stubbornly and stupidly prioritizing being a racial and cultural homogenous country over the need for an influx of immigrants. 
And therefore, a phenomenon we see happening all across East Asia, but especially in Japan, is companies rehiring retired people or extending the retirement deadlines to make up for the missing new blood. That and them hiring more women. But this is a conversation for another time. This is it for this week. I'm Kay, and this was this week's news analysis. Thank you for watching, and as usual, if you like my work, please share these videos, leave a comment, like, and subscribe. See ya!